I can so we can get the debate started. Um, I guess the first thing I want to do is uh, thank everyone for being here and also thank the student organizations for putting this on. The Student Secular Alliance uh, is a fantastic student org at RSU. They have been incredibly involved in the community and done a lot of work to create opportunities like this uh, so that we can have some intellectual debate around uh, topics that people are passionate about. So it's really excellent. This is our second debate that we're having. And so uh, I want to provide just a quick introduction to Jen Semmer, our uh, SSA president, and she can introduce our speakers. And then shortly after that, we'll uh, go through the format and expectations and get started. Check. Y'all hear me okay? All right. You let me know when to when to go. Uh, go for it. I'd like to thank Rogers State University and the Secular Student Alliance for this amazing opportunity to be here tonight to defend the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Jennifer Stimmer, who has been wonderful to dialogue with in preparation for this event. I'd also like to thank Nathaniel for his willingness to come out and dialogue with me on this very important topic. I believe that this very question is the most important question that any of, us, any of us can answer. Did Jesus rise from the grave? Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, 
that if Jesus did not rise from the grave, then Christianity is useless, it's futile, and I could not agree with him more. However, if Jesus did rise from the grave, then Christianity is true. I believe there are at least two ways that one can come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The first is the existential. The second is the historical. And so tonight, I am going to focus on the historical case for the resurre resurrection. Now, one preliminary note before we get started with my uh, facts. And it has to do with how we approach the Bible in this evening's debate. Now, I know that Nathaniel and I have a different view on the New Testament. If we don't, it'll be a short debate. Uh, and so, I also know that there are those in the audience this evening who don't view Scripture the same way that I view Scripture. But I believe that the case for the resurrection is so strong that in tonight's debate, I am not going to appeal to the Bible uh, in the following ways. I will not appeal to divine inspiration of the Bible. I will not appeal to fulfilled prophecy in the Bible. And I will not uh, appeal to inerrancy uh, of Scripture. Nor will I appeal to personal experiences that I've had with my own walk, uh, in my own walk with Jesus Christ. I am simply looking at the New Testament as a collection of ancient documents and seeking to discern the historical facts contained within them, and then looking to see what's the best explanation of the facts. Just as historians look at Roman sources to talk about Rome, just as uh, historians look at Union and Confederate sources to investigate the Civil War, I'm appealing to the earliest Christian sources to see what we can gather about the resurrection. Therefore, I will appeal to the Gospels this evening as Greco-Roman biographies, because if the Gospels can be placed in a specific genre, they most closely resemble this one. Like Greco-Roman biographies, the Gospels are written in continuous narrative form. The stories, the antidotes, and speeches are combined to form the narrative. The life of the main character is not always covered in chronological order. Attention is focused solely on the main character rather than on the era, events, or the government that's in place. Furthermore, the, the life of the philosopher or teacher uh, is usually arranged topically in order to display the ideas and the teachings of the main character. Furthermore, the main character is illuminated through his words and deeds as a model for the reader to either emulate or avoid. Also, I will only appeal to New Testament documents which are categorized as the accepted or recognized letters of Paul. They are 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, Philippians, Philemon, 2 Corinthians, and Romans. These restrictions are in place because I want to meet Nathaniel and those who think like Nathaniel where they are this evening and make the case that even with these restrictions, the resurrection is a historical event. Now with these preliminary points out of the way, I'll now turn to my main argument. In tonight's debate, I propose to defend two main arguments. First, that there are three facts that must be explained by any adequate historical hypothesis. And those facts are the following. One, that Jesus died by crucifixion. Two, shortly after his crucifixion, his disciples believed and proclaimed that they had seen the risen Jesus. And three, a few years after his death, Paul, an enemy of Christianity, converted to Christianity after encountering what he believed to be the risen Jesus. And then my second argument is that the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the grave. Now let's look at my first main argument, that there are three facts which must be explained by any adequate historical hypothesis. Fact number one, that Jesus died by crucifixion. The death of Jesus Christ by crucifixion is attested by a multitude of ancient sources. The Roman historian Tacitus states that Nero fastened the guilty of the burning of Rome and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, who, who name, whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Furthermore, Josephus, Lucian, and Marabar Serapion are at least aware of the event Jesus' execution is reported in all four Gospels and in the, in the recognized writings of Paul the Apostle. 
His death also appears in the earliest creeds of the early church, the earliest being 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3. Also, something that should be taken into consideration is that there is a very low probability of surviving crucifixion. Josephus records that just based on the scourgings alone before people were hung on the cross, that their veins and arteries became visible. Also, to date, there is only one historical account of someone surviving Roman crucifixion, and it wasn't Jesus. Furthermore, scholars from all stripes agree that Jesus died by crucifixion. Atheist Gerd Ludemann in The Resurrection of Jesus, History, Experience, and Theology on page 50 states, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. J.D. Crossan, who denies the authenticity of a large majority of Jesus' sayings, states in Jesus, a revolutionary biography, there is not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. That he was crucified was as sure as anything historical can ever be. In his work, The Passion, the True Story of an Event that Changed Human History, Jewish scholar Geza Vermesh states, The Passion of Jesus is a part of history. Skeptical scholar Paula Fredrickson says in her work, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around the Passover in the manner Rome reserved particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. Furthermore, if that wasn't enough, the American Medical Association concluded interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. So as we've surveyed the death of Jesus, the evidence shows that Jesus died by crucifixion and that his death is reported by Romans, Jews, is found in the earliest oral creeds of the church, and the earliest documents of the church as well. This was a historical event. And the reason that I point to this fact is that based upon my research, I cannot tell whether or not Nathaniel believes that Jesus was a historical figure. Therefore... If fact number one is correct, then Nathaniel needs to answer whether he believes that Jesus was a historical figure. And if he was, does he agree with fact number one? And if he doesn't, why not? Fact number two. Shortly after his crucifixion, the disciples believed and proclaimed that they had seen the risen Jesus. Some of the earliest oral creeds found in the New Testament reveal what the earliest teachings of Christianity were in relation to Jesus. One such oral creed is Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, which states, Concerning his son, who is descendant of David according to the flesh, and he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Scholars such as James Dunn of Durham University and Bart Ehrman of UNC Chapel Hill believe this to be an early creed originating in Jerusalem for the following reasons. There's an antithetical parallelism, which is within the text. The text moves that Jesus was from God, descended of David, according to the flesh, according to the spirit. Furthermore, the term spirit of holiness is nowhere else found in the Pauline corpus, which means most likely Paul is incorporating a creed that he received. Also, the term spirit of holiness reflects a pattern of Aramaic and Hebrew phraseology more so than Greek phraseology. And Ehrman concludes that this most likely goes back to the earliest creeds handed down in Aramaic, as he says, the language of Jesus and his earliest disciples. Another oral creed that is, is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 7, which Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, then that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles. Now, how do we know that this is a creedal statement? Notice in the passage that Paul's use of delivered and received indicate that Paul is handing down something that he got from someone else. As with Romans chapter 1 uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, there are non-Pauline traits that accompany this section. The term for our sins is absent elsewhere in Paul's writings, with the lone exception of Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. Paul
Paul doesn't prefer for our sins. Paul prefers the term sin. The phrase according to the scriptures is also absent in the Pauline corpus. And that the same is true for the phrase the twelve. Furthermore, and I don't have time to go through all of them, there are parallelism, parallelisms littered throughout the text. So, given, that, given Paul's use of delivering and receiving terminology, along with the other factors seen in this section, we can demonstrate that this is a oral creed. Now, how do we know that this is early? Well, Jesus was crucified around A.D. 30. In A.D. 33, Paul became a Christian. In Galatians chapter 1.18, Paul mentions that three years after his conversion, he went to Jerusalem to see Peter and James. This means that Paul visited Jerusalem in A.D. 36. Paul's term here for visit is historio, which literally means to investigate. In other words, Paul didn't go up to Jerusalem to talk about the weather or Oklahoma football. <laughs> this suggests that, when, that Paul went up to get information about the faith from the pillars of the church who were also eyewitnesses. The upshot of this is that since Paul visited in A.D. 36, it means that the creedal statement that he passed on was, was around prior to A.D. 36, within five years of Jesus' death on the cross. Another supplemental fact to point uh, number two is that the nature of the appearances support the disciples' belief that Jesus rose from the dead. The appearance accounts in the Gospels are polymodal in nature. What do I mean by that? It means that Jesus appeared at different times, at different places, with different people, and engaged in different activities. Luke records that Jesus appeared with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. John records that Jesus appeared to the twelve indoors and encountered the doubting one, Thomas. John also records that Jesus was making breakfast by the Sea of Galilee for seven disciples towards the end of his gospel. And 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus appeared to 500 people at the same time. Now, in accordance with fact number one, scholars from all stripes, I repeat, all stripes, agree with fact number two. Once again, Gerd Ludemann, an atheist, states in what really happened, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. In his uh, work, The Foundation of New Testament uh, Christology, theologian Reginald Fuller from Cambridge states, the disciples thought that they had uh, witnessed Jesus' appearance. However, they are explained is a fact which both believer and unbeliever may agree. Once again, Paul Fredrickson states, I know in their own terms they saw uh, what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historical evidence we have afterwards attests that they're, to that conviction that that's what they saw. Now, I'm not saying they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know as a historian, they must have seen something. Now, the willingness for the earliest apostles or the earliest uh, disciples to suffer and die testifies to their sincerity in that belief. It does not prove the resurrection, but it shows that they were in a position uh, to know whether or not what they saw was absolutely true or absolutely false. They are not like um, us today in our position or some other martyrs from some other religion today that get stuff secondhand. They were in a prime position to know whether or not what they saw was true. So the nexus of their willingness to suffer and die stems from the centrality of the resurrection and uh, appearance of Jesus. Thus, given the earliest sources, namely the creeds of the infant church, we see the disciples believed and proclaimed that Jesus rose from the grave. Furthermore, it's historically accurate to state that the earliest disciples were willing to suffer and die for what they believed in, thus testifying to the sincerity of their belief. Moving on, fact number three. Within a few years of Jesus' death, Paul, an enemy of the early church, was converted to Christianity after having an experience in which he believed he saw the risen Jesus. 
sticking with the Pauline corpus that I laid out in my, uh, in my introduction. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul states, Last of all, as one untimely born, he, Jesus, also appeared to me. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1, he says, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, as Paul talks about his ministry, he states, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and, was, and who called me to his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach among the Gentiles, the majority of scholars believe that Paul believed that he had seen the post-resurrected Jesus while traveling to Damascus to persecute Christians. So here's the conclusion to my first argument in summary. That Jesus died, after, Jesus died by crucifixion. Shortly after his crucifixion, his disciples believed and proclaimed that they had seen the risen Jesus. And then within a few years of Jesus' death, Paul, an enemy of the church, converted after experiencing what he believed to be an experience with the risen Jesus. Now let me move on to argument number two. The best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the grave. In his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, C.B. McCullough lists six tests that historians use to determine the best explanation for a given historical fact. The hypothesis that, G that God raised Jesus from the dead meets all of these. It has great explanatory scope in that all the facts are addressed by the hypothesis of the resurrection. It has great explanatory power because the resurrection hypothesis explains each fact well without ambiguity or forcing the issue. It is plausible given the historical context of Jesus' own life, claims, and teachings. And so the resurrection merely serves as the divine confirmation of those claims. It's not ad hoc or contrived, for it only requires an additional hypothesis that God exists, which I take to be established by the arguments of natural theology. It's also in accordance with accepted beliefs. The hypothesis that Jesus rose from the dead is not in conflict with the belief that people don't rise from the dead naturally. I accept that belief as much as I accept the hypothesis that Jesus rose from the dead. It outperforms its rival theories in meeting the first five conditions. And so on the basis of what I've said tonight, I think the best explanation of the facts is the one that the early eyewitnesses gave, that God raised Jesus from the grave. If Nathaniel is to carry tonight's debate, he must first tear down the resurrection hypothesis and raise his own argument that explains the facts better than the resurrection hypothesis. He cannot simply stand up here tonight and give a glorified nah -uh. If Nathaniel fail, fails to tear down the argument and provide a better hypothesis, all here, and I say this with respect, including Nathaniel, should give serious consideration to the affirmative case for Jesus rising from the day, gra grave, and even more serious, give consideration Christianity. Thank you. I saw that uh, Caleb Moore is hosting a Answering Skeptics seminar on October 14th. And I kind of want to come back up here and see how they answer people like me. Uh, I'd first like to thank Jennifer and the amazing team there at the SSA here at Rogers State University. Actually, the Hillcats down in Texas, we have the Bearcats. Uh, I don't know what a Hillcat is. I honestly <laughs> have no idea. But apparently, you guys were good at basketball last year, so congratulations. Uh, the SSA plays a valuable role in the lives of many secular students and young adults across the country. And it is my hope that you continue to grow and create leaders in your communities and in local and state governments. Thank you again. 
Jennifer, I have a couple of questions for you, if that's okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what year are you? I'm a senior. Nice. When, when do you graduate? Uh, next year in May. All right. Uh, what is your projected career path? Uh, forensic psychology. All right. And what did you have for dinner last night? Chips Ahoy cereal. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so from, from Bart Ehrman, what does it mean, what do historians look for? when we are trying to figure out something that happened in the past. First off, he says, contemporary accounts close to the time of the events. Then we look for lots of sources. We look for those sources to be consistent with one another, and they must not be biased or skewed toward their own self-interest. Now, I am a fan of mythology. As my good friend Dean can tell you, I really enjoy a riveting story. I'm obviously not the only one, you're all here tonight. The story of Jesus is, at times, incredibly riveting. If you've ever seen any of the cinematic performances of his crucifixion, death, and resurrection, you know how emotionally heavy the entire series of events seems to be. Now, this isn't unique to Jesus. This past Friday, my partner and I went and watched the movie Joker. If you want to see an emotional film, please take the time to sit down and watch. The roller coaster throughout is something to behold, not just with the main character, but also those involved. And side note, I had no idea Robert De Niro was in that film. So, I'll watch it for him, if nothing else. But stories are not new. They have been inundated in our society since the beginning of time memorials, as we can write things down even before then we pass down stories. Let's consider Jesus. What are some of the attributes of the story we're discussing this evening? Well, he was stripped, he was beaten, crucified, he died, rose after three days, stated that he's going to send Satan, which is undoubtedly the evolution of Hasatan from the Old Testament, right down to hell, and now has a religion named after him that some of you may have heard of. He's also known as the bright morning star, or Venus, and is affectionately called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. This, we are told, is all unique to Christianity. But is it? Are the stories of Jesus really unique? As you can imagine, and because I'm bringing up an example, no. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail regarding a bunch of previous mythologies and gods, but I feel at least a bit of knowledge is pertinent when discussing what to believe. This does not just apply to religion. Let's first consider the Mesopotamian goddess Inanna. How many of you have heard of Inanna? It's a fairly what I expected, so good, thank you. Now, how many of you have heard of Ishtar? And what about Aphrodite? That is the same goddess. And by the way, if you uh, want to use that in the future when you're speaking about the Greek mythologies, talk about Aphrodite and call her Inanna, or Ishtar, it's the same person. But what makes her like Jesus, and why would I bring her up? Well, she was stripped, she was crucified, she rose again three days later, and sent the shepherd god Dumuzi, or Tammuz, to hell. She's also known as Venus, and her Babylonian symbol is a lion. She also had a Sumerian religion named after her. Do these similarities mean the Christians borrowed from the story of Inanna to create the story of Jesus. No, not at all. But they certainly knew of the story. She's even mentioned in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 14, where the Son of Man, and by the way, no, that's not Jesus, no matter what they try to tell you about that verse or anything that happens in Isaiah, chapter 53. The Son of Man sees Israelites mourning the death of Tammuz. This means they knew about the gods and the goddesses. Does this mean they borrow from the story? No, but it means they knew. It is important again to note that for the sake of this debate, and only this debate, I am granting the historical authenticity of Jesus, or Yeshua ben Joseph. I'm also granting for the sake of this debate that this person was crucified and that he died. I'm also not going to try to convince anybody of some odd swoon theory, although if you would like to talk about it later, I'm open to suggestion. 
The idea that somebody lived in the past is a wholly unremarkable claim. People live today, people lived in the past. The fact that somebody was crucified is also unremarkable. The Romans, quite good at that, actually. There are even words excruciating, things like this, that are named specifically because of the crucifixion. But the notion of a God rising from the dead, especially for redemption of a person or people, being unique to Christianity or even Jesus is simply untrue. Even the author of Mark wrote down that people thought Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. It's not even unique to Jesus in his own book. This was commonplace in ancient mythology. And to give you a quick, a couple of more uh, names, Zamoxis, Osiris, Lucian, who I'm surprised you didn't bring up. That's, that's the first time I've, I've been involved in one of these. You didn't bring up Lucian. Uh, or Lucian, however you want to say his name. Uh, said this about what an antagonist had told him. I know a man who came to life more than 20 days after his burial, having attended the fellow both before, and at, before his death and after he came back to life. This is the same Lucian, by the way, that wrote Christians worship to this day, a man who was crucified. If you're going to take the things that he says historically, you cannot pick and choose those things. But that's not all. Look at Adonis, Romulus, Alcidus, Theseus. If you'd like a lengthy list and not the incorrect list you might see on Bill Maher's uh, movie Religious, don't, don't watch that movie. Uh, I have a long Google Doc with references cited. You, can, you come up to me after this, I'll give it to you. And by the way, I learned things in college about sourcing my material. Now, we're often told that people won't die for a lie. We're often told that disciples didn't change their story even upon pain of death. Now, besides the fact that we have no evidence to substantiate this claim because most of the disciples ran away before Jesus was even crucified, let's consider the following. And if it's okay, I'd like to tell you a story. Because I like stories, do you like stories? Um, and actually, I I need to make a quick a quick phone call if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Because stories are important. Props are important. I like props. I was in theater. I don't know if Dean ever went to theater, but being a preacher, obviously. Now I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened to me very recently. And to do this, I need the one that was involved. Now, I own corgis. Oh, own them, I think, is a word I'm not going to use. Stanley Hill. This is Stanley Hill and Benny Parkinson. Recently, I was hanging out with Benny Barkington. We live in a apartment in Arlington, Texas. I think I'm just going to walk around, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and I went to take Benny downstairs because he had to go outside. He was supposed to stay up there with me and we practiced this. It didn't work out. Well, we had to go downstairs, right? And it was outside, and we were late at night, and even in Arlington, Texas, late at night, there isn't much traffic. Went downstairs because Benny, the one with the tail, had to go and use the restroom. So he ran down the stairs really quickly, and I followed him down there. And then I said, okay, well, let's get you taken care of. And whenever Benny was done using the bathroom, obviously I could clean it after him and everything, and Benny started barking at something, as he will, with the last name Barkington. And I said, Benny, what is, what is going on? Because usually the one that barks is the one without the tail. And he was incredibly aggravated at something. And I wondered what it was. And then I realized that I could see what it was. And I looked very close to my, to my young corgi there. And I saw a triceratops. I don't know if any of you know what a triceratops is. Triceratops is. It's a ceratopsia. It's an ornithischian from the Cretaceous period, the Mesozoic era. They are, they are extinct, but I saw a Triceratops, and thankfully Triceratops was, was not very hungry at that point. Of course, he wouldn't have eaten me. They're very much plant-eating herbivores, which is the same, means the same thing. And, but also apparently just 
Also wasn't in the mood to try and run me over anything either, big rhinoceros that they are or were. And I know I saw this thing because I was able to reach out and touch it. And I was able to feel its breath, and I was able to see its beak, and everything. And I said, I know something very important here. I need to provide evidence. How am I going to provide evidence? The best way to provide evidence is I need to get a picture. And I realized that for the first time and maybe in my life, I didn't have my phone with me. I have two up here. I had none with me at that point. And so I ran back upstairs, leaving Benny with the, uh, I supposedly extinct dinosaur, and ran back upstairs, came and got my, my camera, and ran downstairs to try and take a photo of this dinosaur, only to find that the dinosaur was gone. No longer there, neither was Benny acting erratically anymore, much like he does right now. And I searched all over for this dinosaur, knowing that I had seen this dinosaur, knowing that I had experienced this dinosaur, knowing that it was there. And for me, that's a bit of a big deal, because I have fossils strewn about my apartment. This is a real thing. I showed them on video. And so I drove around trying to find this, but could not. Neither could Benny again. I don't actually know where Stanley was in this ordeal. And I went to sleep, and then of course I woke up the next day, and I went and I told my friends, you can go to the Perot Museum in Dallas if you would like, I know some of them. And I told them I had seen this dinosaur. And I said it was an ornithistian, so it was not a modern day dinosaur, with known as birds. But no, it was definitely a triceratops. And my friends asked me for the evidence of it. Did you, did it leave any footprints? <laughs> no, it didn't leave any footprints. Did it leave any, did it leave any fecal matter? Because you would see that. If you've ever seen Jurassic Park, you know what it looks like. And I said, no, it did not. No footprints, no nothing, could see nothing of this dinosaur. But I know that I saw this dinosaur and I believe that I saw this dinosaur. And even, and I would tell you that I saw this dinosaur but to pain of death, to quote the Princess Bride. And I would die telling you that I saw this dinosaur. I believed it. I still believe it to this day. Does that mean that the dinosaur was there? No, it does not. Could have been, but why would you believe me? And also, would you be right to be skeptical of my claim that I saw a dinosaur? Of course you would be. And I can tell you that I would not believe me either. Now I need four volunteers, just four, real quick. Wow, thank, thank you for the four of you to raise your hand. <laughs> no, you can't. I was say, I didn't think you wanted to. No, no, <laughs> four, okay. Four, all right, do I have four? Okay. How, how much time do I have left? Yes, five. Okay, I'm having a good time. I stand on this now. Okay, who was it? One, two, three. So, there you go. Thanks so much. Um, and then will you take those? They obviously want to say hi. Those three there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank What I would like for you to do, and by the way, let me use your neighbors on this. I would like for you to write the questions and answers Jennifer and I did back and forth at the beginning of this. Don't use your neighbors. Please. While they're doing that, I wonder if any of you can do the same. Because Everybody in here is an eyewitness to our conversation just 10, 15 minutes ago. We should be able to write this down very easily. Much easier, of course, than let's say something decades later by second, third, fourth, fifth hand accounts by nobody that was an eyewitness. We're talking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or if you would like some of the 36 other gospels, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Acts of Peter, my personal favorites. Thomas, 
Who, by the way, you like Thomas as well, huh? He's got some pretty funny stuff. Yes, he does. Call it funny if you'd like. But I think the Apocalypse of Peter is more, more on the mythology side, I think you would agree. The talking, the walking, talking cross. Yes. Whenever you're done, please let me know so I can collect those. Thank you. Because I think this is really important. I think that you can hopefully you can see kind of where I'm going with this. How'd you do? Because you know this is pretty well, right? Yeah. yeah. That's a bias. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. This is just like back in school. All right. I'd like to thank uh, Matthew, Mark, Marjorie, and Jonah for your, there we go, your senior, uh, your major English career path forensic psychologist, and their last night serial. So close, except I didn't ask, I don't think what your major was. No. I appreciate this one, which is simply three questions. When you graduate in spring 2020, major, and what are, what are your plans after graduation? I don't know. Did you have a dinner last night? What is your year? This one is the closest. And yet, nobody got all four questions and all four answers. And yet, you would say that you know her, right? I don't know which one is yours, and I'm not going to do that to you. How can we expect something if somebody doesn't know it? If they don't know something 10 minutes from now for some, from the exact source sitting there, now I understand obviously it's somebody coming back from the dead, which is only reported, by the way, it doesn't matter if somebody talks about it in, in the year 111, or if somebody speaks about it, the only thing we have from the first century at all is a little piece of parchment that's about this large. I, it doesn't matter if somebody talks about it. This happened from right, the source is sitting in the front row. This was 10 minutes ago. And yet, not a single person, even though they know her well, could get that right. How can you expect to see something from not just four, but any of the other 36 Gospels to get it right either? And Dean, I don't give a damn whether Jesus lived or not. We can talk about that at a different time. All right? We could actually, we could have a debate about that, but that's not going to happen tonight. Jesus died. That's cool and everything. And, and, and here, here you go. Go There you go. Uh, I forgot one of those. And I was, I was going to respond to something else, but I'm pretty much out of time. And I, I really appreciate being up here, Dean. This has been a good time. Thank you very much. <laughs> you want a dog? In my opening speech, I claimed or said that I was going to defend two propositions tonight. One, that there was uh, an adequate, there were three facts that must be adequately understood uh, and delineated by a historical hypothesis. And two, the best explanation of those facts is that Jesus rose from the dead. Once again, those facts are that Jesus died by crucifixion. Shortly after Jesus' death, his disciples proclaimed and believed that they saw Jesus rise from the dead. And number three, that Paul, an enemy of the church, uh, uh, several years after Jesus' death, uh, had an experience in which he believed he saw the risen Jesus. Now, I think it's great that Nathaniel agrees with me on fact one. Uh, and I would welcome that conversation about Jesus being a person of history. Because if he died on the cross, then he's a person of history. Uh, and to another point, um, it's interesting that Nathaniel says, for the sake of tonight's conversation, he'll accept that, which leads me to believe that outside of this conversation, he doesn't believe that, which would put him on the fringe uh, of, of scholarship. Now, let's look. Uh, notice also that he didn't specifically address facts two or facts three. 
He didn't dispute those. He simply said things like, uh, we can't uh, you know, trust Ivan's testimony. He said things like, the method of Bart Ehrman, he only mentioned one that Ehrman states, which is that uh, they shouldn't be biased. Well, guess what? Every historian is biased. Every historian in antiquity and today is biased. Ronald Reagan gives one sentence to his divorce, where other biographers give whole paragraphs to his divorce. So uh, that's just uh, a skewed part of Ehrman's methodology. That's nothing to indict uh, the resurrection. Um, but also, we do have good eyewitness testimony. What Nathaniel didn't mention anything about the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, and to disprove that that was an early oral creed passed down to Paul and given to other people. He didn't mention anything about Romans chapter 1, uh, that creed being an early oral creed. He simply bypassed it. Uh, and didn't mention, I would like for him to address that. How does he know that those aren't early eyewitness testimonies? And what information does he have to go against the case I laid out for them? He did address that in his opening uh, position. And I don't think that he can address it in his rebuttal. Um, he mentioned uh, the Joker in passing. Okay, everybody uh, who has ever uh, done a film about the Joker, done a, done a comic about the Joker, has admitted that the Joker is fictitious. Jesus is a person of history. It's, it's not analogous at all. Um, also, he says, um, you know, the thing that Israel and, and the New Testament uh, characters knew about these gods. Well, okay, just because uh, they know them doesn't mean that they necessarily copied from them. Knowing something doesn't mean that you've copied from something. And what's interesting is Nathaniel actually agrees with me about the Old Testament. When Nathaniel said about these ancient Near East dying and rising gods is confirmed in the Old Testament that yes, the, Isra uh, the Isra Israelites did know about these dying and rising gods and they're mentioned in there, which seems to me, uh, this is a, may be a completely different debate, I think it is, but I'm glad that Nathaniel affirms uh, pieces of the Old Testament being historically accurate. I think that's a great point that he makes there and so I'm glad that he agrees with me on that. He says we don't have any evidence of disciples, early disciples dying uh, the vast majority of historians, specifically New Testament historians, would say that Peter died in Rome. The vast majority of New Testament scholars and historians would say that Paul died uh, as well. Uh, so those are at least two pieces uh, of evidence there um, for early disciples or apostles dying for what they believe. I simply said that their death indicates the sincerity of the belief. Sincerity of the belief doesn't prove the belief. I appreciate, uh, with all due respect, the dog uh, and pony show. That was uh, very, very well done, very creative. Um, also, one thing that we should understand with the demonstration that was taking place here with the uh, three or four people here is that the culture of today is different than the culture of then. The culture of then was a strictly oral culture. By the age of 12, Jewish boys could memorize the Torah. That is not the case today. So you can't take the culture of today and bind it on the culture of yesteryear. Um, so there's, there's that point. Um, also, um, a group of eyewitnesses could complete a uniform list even if a single individual cannot. Even if a single individual cannot. A group can. This is how cops put people away for murder. They separate the eyewitnesses and they say, hey, what did you see? What did you see? What did you see? And just because person one over here gets everything but one thing wrong and people over here get everything but three things wrong, what do the cops do? They say, hey, he got this piece right. This person got that piece right. This person got that piece right. It seems like the person who committed the murder committed the murder. That's just good uh, police work. And what we have in the New Testament is exactly that. We have um, you know, good police work being done by the authors. Notice again, he didn't address anything about the nature of the appearances uh, in the Gospels. He didn't mention anything about the 500. He didn't mention anything about, the, about Jesus and the seven and the Sea of Galilee. He didn't mention anything about Thomas. Once again, he simply bypassed that and said, hey, you just can't uh, trust eyewitness reports. Uh, but once again, a group of eyewitnesses can complete a uniform list 
um, with a single eyewitness, uh, even if a single eyewitness couldn't. Also, um, I, I think he's trying to use what took place over here as an analogy for the eyewitnesses in the Gospels. But there's a problem with that, is that here with this piece, uh, this illustration over here, that was strictly auditory. What do you remember audibly? Whereas the disciples would have remembered the death of somebody. People are more prone to remember the death of a loved one rather than just hearing about the death of a loved one or somebody and the details um, with regards to that. Now let's move to the rising in, and dying gods in general. Um, uh, T.D. Uh, Mettinger uh, states the following. Uh, there is now what amounts to a scholarly consensus against the appropriateness of the concept of dying and rising gods in the ancient Near East world. Those who still think differently, and this is them being compared to the story of Jesus, those who think, uh, who, those who still think differently are looked upon as a residual member of an almost extinct species. The result of my investigation led me to challenge this um, uh, scholarly consensus and to disagree with a number of colleagues whom I greatly esteem. And so he gives the reasons why he does that. The world of ancient Near East religions actually knew a number of deities. I agree with that. Uh, the, gods, uh, the gods that die and rise, notice this, have close ties. Just about every god that he mentioned has close ties to the seasonal cycle of plant life. They are closely connected to the seasons. Jesus explicitly is not connected to agriculture. It's a false analogy. And to rely upon that is what Medinger says, puts somebody in the class of an extinct, almost extinct species. Also, um, the reason that the dying and rising gods analogy would not work is that by the time of the first century, um, there are certain changes that took place within the Jewish culture. And Christianity has Jewish roots, which means what? One, as we've stated already, they are a oral they are an oral culture, but two, the biggest difference between the Jews during the time of the Old Testament and the Jews of the first century is that in the Old Testament, I would agree with Nathaniel, uh, maybe to this point, that the Jews had a, a propensity to accept foreign gods and adapt foreign gods, whereas in the New Testament, what are they doing? They are in rebellion against Rome because they don't want to adopt their gods. They don't want to adopt their gods. And so that is significant when we talk about this comparison between dying and rising gods. Let me give you an example of just uh, uh, how out of whack this tends to get. Let's go with the example that he raised with Osiris. Um, there are a lot of, this is a popular one that states Osiris was some type of Christ figure that died and was raised from uh, the grave. Now, what we know about Osiris is that, um, is that there's no evidence that Osiris had some type of Eucharist uh, ceremony in which his flesh was eaten uh, in the form of communi uh, communion cakes. Uh, there's the claim that Osiris taught many of the same things as Jesus. There's no evidence of that uh, either. Osiris uh, is the brother of Seth. Seth kills, uh, convinces Osiris to get into a coffin. He gets into the coffin. Uh, Seth sends the coffin. He drowns Osiris. Uh, Isis uh, comes back, or excuse me, um, excuse me. He uh, he cuts Osiris into fourteen pieces. Sends him on his way and scatters him throughout the earth. Isis, as she's grieved, goes and finds him, resuscitates him, and he he uh, takes the role. Of the, the God of the underworld. Sounds nothing like what we see in the gospel narrative. Sounds nothing uh, like what Paul talks about in the accepted Pauline uh, letters. It sounds nothing like what we see in the oral creeds. This is just a atheist meme that runs around on the internet. Uh, has no ties, no connections uh, to Jesus. Um, what else? Um, I think that I have addressed everything that um, that Nathaniel has raised. So in conclusion, with the minute that I have left, um, just notice the facts that he did not address with regards to facts uh, two and three. He temporarily agreed with fact one just for the sake of the debate. 
Uh, he didn't address anything about the appearances. He didn't address anything uh, in his opening statement about um, uh, the creeds. And we've seen clearly from scholarship uh, that the connection between the dying and rising gods is just not there. Uh, so I think that my first, uh, my first three facts hold. Uh, my first argument holds. My second argument holds. And with that, I yield back.
Let's not even consider how many other religions were there. The religion of Attis. If you've never heard about that, Attis and Sibylle. If you've never looked that up, you wonder why they're all around a bunch of eunuchs. Because somebody is so beautiful that you castrate yourself. Literally, a religion was going around Rome at the exact same time that Christianity was attempting to make itself known. So this is not even close to something that's unique. But again, where do we get the idea that Jesus rose from the grave? Where is it mentioned at all anywhere else outside of the Bible? The correct answer is nowhere. Where is the 500 mentioned? Nowhere. Paul, and we've had this discussion more than once, and you're always wrong about it. Uh, Paul never saw a physical resurrected Jesus, and he made that very clear all throughout his writings. He had visions. I've gone through this more than once, and I've spoken about it in detail. And yes, I'll take Richard Carrier's stance on this. That Paul was a schizotypal who saw visions. I mean, he did see visions. What do we call that today if you see a vision? Do we think that you're a prophet of God? No. We say you see visions and you hallucinate. Especially when you consider in the book of Galatians where he says he went up to the third level of heaven. Does the third level of heaven even exist? It depends which religion you follow. And also, as again, as Bart Ehrman says, how does all this, when we look at all of this, I can't take the gospel seriously anyway, because when I want to ask a question about what day did Jesus die, what time did he die, who all went to the tomb, was the tomb even there, was it Joseph of Arimathea, which we don't even know that person even existed at all, it depends which gospel you read. And if I can't take the gospel seriously, why am I going to take the idea that the gospel, the Bible should be some sort of perfect document that I can get history from? It's not a history book. In any way, it's a history book. There's, the genealogies of Jesus by themselves are completely out of whack. The creed, again, you know who else has a creed? The Mormons. They have a wonderful creed. Spoken to. And you know what? And, and a lot of people that were even in Joseph Smith's life, as part of his family, left the church. You know what they never did? They never recanted. Not even one time. Does that, does that mean that, that Mormonism is the one true faith? It's a good question to ask. I know plenty of Mormons. They think it is. Me mentioning the book of Ezekiel, by the way, and the book of Isaiah, doesn't mean that I believe it. I just simply mention it because we have to talk about Jesus, and Jesus is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, if, if you come through and you have people lined up, and you give testimony to the police, they don't take bits and pieces of your testimony. If your testimony is contradictory, they throw it out. They don't use it. I only, by the way, said that Osiris was one of the plethora of dying and rising gods. I, again, and, and I'm going to ask you to not like to not make it seem as though I'm saying things I'm not. Osiris was one of, again, many, 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 many dying and rising gods. He has many stories about how he died and rose again. We can talk about Romulus, who would like. And how 72, the number com comes up in not just Christianity, but also the story of Romulus. How many people condemned Romulus to death? And then we can look at Islam as well. How many, how many virgins do you supposedly get? These numbers are, are, are it's, it, they're in so many different religions. But again, Jesus died on a cross. Unremarkable. Jesus was maybe buried somewhere. Unremarkable. Rising from the dead. If a body disappeared today, I'm not saying this happened, but we had this conversation in April. If a body disappeared today, you would not say, oh my gosh, it's Jesus. You wouldn't say it automatically rose from the dead. If a body disappeared today and it was somebody that you loved, Dean, you would go and say, who took the body? Where's the body at? You wouldn't automatically say this body rose from the grave. And again, this is not something I'm saying happened but people don't just automatically say, again, when there's zero, zero, period, ever examples of anybody ever rising from the dead, even though there are a plethora of mythology saying this is the case, you don't actually say somebody rose from the dead. In fact, if you look in the book of Matthew, only Matthew is the only one that ever says, without anybody even there, that a bunch of, of, uh, of, of, of Jewish Sanhedrin got together and said, 
Nobody was even around for that conversation. It's like Jesus talking to himself when he's on the freaking mountain. Who records these things? It's like Moses writing his own death in Deuteronomy. It's nonsense. Yeah, I think that's a good way to end that. Thank you. Alright, as I stated in my opening, that I was going to defend the two major arguments. The first argument being uh, that there are three facts that must be adequately answered by any um, historical hypothesis. And those facts were that Jesus rose or Jesus died by crucifixion. Shortly after that, the disciples had experiences in which they saw Jesus. And then Paul, an enemy of the church, converted to Christianity after having an experience in which he believed he saw Jesus. The risen Jesus. Now, um, if you notice, what Nathaniel did here um, is is quite quite interesting. Uh, preliminary issues before I really go. Uh, I'd like to say hard in the paint. Um, number one, I didn't mention Pliny the Younger in my opening statement. I mentioned uh, Tacitus. Um, also, I agree with Nathaniel uh, that the Jews in the Old Testament uh, had heard of. These gods, that's all, all I said. Um, also, when it comes to the uh, dying and rising gods, I just used Osiris as an example for the whole and then cited scholarly work on the connection between the dying and rising gods and why they don't work. Uh, Nathaniel just simply doubled down on what he said in his opening statement with regards to the dying and rising gods. Um, also, it should also be noted, Nathaniel mentioned the empty tomb. Uh, while I find uh, that to be uh, you know, an interesting topic for another time, that was not a part of my first three facts. So what's going on at this, at this point is Nathaniel is mentioning things uh, to support his <laughs> argument that I didn't even bring into the argument. I didn't bring into the argument Pliny the Younger. I didn't bring into the argument uh, the empty tomb. And I agree with him about the Jews knowing of these Old Testament gods. Now, he does attack Paul. Uh, fact number three, and said uh, that Paul said that he didn't uh, see a, a physical uh, body. Now, what's interesting here is that there are two lines of attack that Nathaniel uses. He says that you know he didn't appear, or Paul didn't believe that uh, he saw a, a real body. So let's just look at this for a second. Jakob Kramer translated the verb appear, translates the verb appear uh, as appeared or let himself be seen and says we cannot deny a visual element a visual element to the verb since throughout the prophets and the New Testament it clearly has the function and he concludes that this verb signifies just as it did in the Old Testament the powerful characteristics of the uh, powerful uh, the power characteristics of Yahweh and the angels to appear visibly and he ascribes that same property to the resurrected Jesus, 
that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul says he appeared in a physical form to me, uh, which I find interesting that that um, that Nathaniel uh, would would raise uh, that idea. Furthermore, the illustration used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is that of a seed that is sown and then reborn. And he mentions in 1 Corinthians 15, he's answering the question, what about the physical body of Christians? What's going to happen with the physical body of Christians? And he says, just as the seed is sown and dies and is reborn, the body is sown as a physical body and will also be raised. That same physical body will be raised and transformed. Uh, Romans 8, 11, I would describe you there that he mentions the physical body. In Philippians, he mentions the physical resurrection and the, uh, the transformation of the physical body, not to something that is, um, you know, ghost-like or anything like that. That simply is outside of the Pauline corpus and that is outside of New Testament scholarship. As Gordon Fee points out, attempts to make uh, the stand for a, for a vision rather than an actual appearance are either irrelevant or simply prejudicial, since it means Christ visibly appeared to people. Paul believes that he saw a real body. Also, when we look um, closer and we look at uh, what Nathaniel said about the Bible, that the Bible is the claim, not the evidence, essentially what Nathaniel is saying is all claims about Jesus found in the Bible don't count because all claims about Jesus are found in the Bible. That's circular reasoning. And, uh, and so how does that follow logically? Think about this for a second. If someone, uh, if someone is murdered and a note is left, which makes a claim about the motive, the makeup of the murder, or clues about when and where the next murder will happen, will the detective say the following? Well, boys, you know, we can't use this note because the claims about the murder are contained in the letter about the murder. physical 
physical body that dies will be changed. Um, so that uh, is, uh, you know, the ending of my rebuttal, and I think my facts um, still hold. seriously examine the uh, claims of the Bible? Give me some contemporary extra-biblical evidence, and I will. Until then, they are claims, nothing more. That's how that works. Sure, you can leave me a note. I'm going to go look at what's written on the note. I'm going to try and find evidence for the stuff that's written on the note. If I can't find the evidence that's on the note, what am I going to do with that note? You mean I'm going to take it seriously? No. I'm going to do something tonight that I said that I wasn't going to do. And I apologize. Because I like to stick to my word. But I'm going to read from the Bible. And I'm going to read from Galatians chapter 1. Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you, you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. Now, I don't know how you would read that, but it seems like revelation. Not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man. How can you say he saw somebody? Or that the person that he saw was a physical being? Acts chapter 9. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, what the man? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus who we are persecuting. Now get up and go in the city. You'll be told what you must do. Now the men... Traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. <clears throat> Paul got up on the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand. He went to Damascus, and they were there for three days and didn't eat anything. Which is great. Except for you read in Acts chapter 22, Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. Which one is it, Dean? Chapter 9 or chapter 22? And which one is it, Dean? Did he get it by revelation or did he get it from a person that he could touch? And actually at that point, did, did, does it matter if Jesus was touched or not? Because that depends which gospel you read. I can't take the Bible seriously, so I have to look extra biblically. And when I look extra biblically, do you know what I find? Nothing. There's nothing in the first century at all. And, and the average lifespan of a person in the first century was less than 50 so you're telling me that somebody who's alive, and by the way, they came from, from Galilee, and even though we need to teach Mark some geography lessons about where Galilee is, uh, they came from Galilee when they were in their 30s, because the book of John can be, which is my favorite gospel, by the way, it really is, out of the ones that are in the Bible, uh, it can be summed up in like three months. It really can. The things that Jesus said in there could be left out in less than three months. It wasn't necessarily in three years. But you're telling me that 33 years old, they would have lived another 20 years. Yeah, they may have they may have passed something around saying we saw these things. But at the point the Gospels were, were written some 40 and 60 and 80 years later, how many people was it passed on to? We've already read the Gospels. We know that they don't that they contain contradictory accounts by themselves. But if, if, if that comes to the case, that it depends which one that I read, then I, should I really take it seriously? Should I at all? Especially if somebody like Paul is saying some of you follow John the Baptist, some of you follow Jesus, some of you follow me. And this is, this is within, what, 20 years after the supposed death and resurrection of Jesus. That's already happening. You're seeing a fracturing of the church at that point. We already know that 
how many books? Are you know, first and second Peter? Are you serious? Don't overlook that. And, and how many books that even claim to be written by Paul in the New Testament weren't even written by him? But you want me to take the writings in there seriously and to look at there's there's nothing, zero people in the first century out of one piece of parchment. There's only there's only one person in the New Testament, one person who ever said, I personally saw the risen Jesus. And that person was Paul. And the stories of that are contradictory in the same book. If that's the case, then how can I take anything that was said about anything in the Bible seriously? I, I don't know that I could. And I once did, as a Christian. And I implore you to read that the same way that I did, and not with an apologetics lens on. Because it is important that we do that. I want to, to do things that my, my friend, and I'm happy to say that Susan is a better friend of Matt Milwaukee's than I am, and it's very jealous, but I'm a better friend of Arden Ra than you, so we'll take that. Uh, uh, Matt Dillon, he says, I want to believe as many true things as possible. I want to. Convince me that this stuff is real. And I'll believe it. It doesn't mean that I'll be a Christian, but I'll certainly believe the Bible. But you've got to provide something more than anecdotes and something that somebody said that I apparently am, am an extinct creature, much like the Triceratops that I promise I saw. Thank you. In tonight's debate, I defended two main arguments, that there are three facts that must be answered by an adequate historical hypothesis. That Jesus died by crucifixion. Shortly after his death, the disciples believed and proclaimed they had seen the risen Jesus. And then within a few years after his death, uh, Paul, an enemy of the church, was converted to Christianity after having an experience which he believed the resurrection, had, uh, resurrection uh, of Jesus. Uh, then two, that God raised Jesus from the de dead is the best explanation uh, of these facts. Now, a couple of preliminary things before I get to my closing. Uh, Nathaniel mentioned that Paul might have been schizotypal in his rebuttal, except there is a problem there because the Harvard Medical Journal notes that schizotypals are people who have extreme anxiety. They're people who are non-social, have trouble maintaining and creating relationships. And as we look in the accepted letters of Paul, that does not seem to be the case for Paul. So that is simply a, a ad hoc response uh, to fact number three. Uh, also, Nathaniel raised the objection about Paul uh, having a revelation instead of getting something handed down from a person that's that some type of contradiction in Galatians. The problem with that is it simply doesn't matter what Paul received by revelation. Uh, he could have received multiple things by revelation. Uh, my case is that 1 Corinthians 15 is a oral creed that he handed down. And still, Nathaniel has not adequately shown why that's not an oral creed. He hasn't done it, and I don't think that he can. Um, he noticed, he mentioned uh, uh, Paul's conversion accounts in Acts. Once again, as with his rebuttal, my case is not built on Acts. My case is built on the accepted letters of Paul that both conservative and liberal scholars accept. Now, if Nathaniel wants to bring in Acts, my question is, does Nathaniel accept the speech sections that are early in Acts? Like in Acts chapter 2, where Peter talks about uh, the life and the death 
and the appearances of Jesus or or uh, Peter's other sermon in Acts chapter 4 or Paul's other sermons that talk about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. If he's going to bring in the supposed contradictions in Acts 9 and Acts 22 and the other section in Acts, then he should accept the other speech sections that are also in Acts in order to be consistent with his argumentation. Now, to the point that he raised about Acts, what we see in Acts chapter 9 is that hearing here is used in the genitive case, which denotes that a sound was heard. The difference between that and Acts chapter 22 is that hearing takes the accusative case, which uh, indicates, in Greek, indicates that a sound was heard, but not completely understood. And so there was no, in the extent of what was being said, and the understanding of what was being said was not understood. Therefore, given the Greek manuscripts, and guys like A.T. Robertson, who's the prince of, uh, you know, Greek, uh, you know, delineating Greek, there is no contradiction here. There just isn't. And so tonight, uh, I have provided what I believe to be good evidence that the best explanation of the facts uh, are. That once again, Nathaniel's answer to these do not have good explanatory scope, do not have good explanatory power. Um, they are not uh, plausible given what we know about things of schizotypals and things like that. Most of the explanations that Nathaniel gives are ad hoc. Um, and so I think that the resurrection uh, case stands. He stated that Paul didn't believe in a, in a physical resurrection. We handled that uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. Nathaniel noted um, you know, the raising the issue um, of Paul being schizotypal. Uh, he mentioned gospel reliability. That's not the debate tonight. And even in the way that I'm approaching the gospels as Greco-Roman uh, Greco bi biographies, there could still be, and I'm not saying that there are, but there could be contradictions within a text, yet still a historical core be there. That's how history is done. Um, and so tonight's debate is not about gospel reliability. Once again, if he wants to have that conversation, we can have that conversation. But the facts still remain. Uh, the resurrection hypothesis is the best explanation of the facts. And Nathaniel has not torn down that uh, argument, and he hasn't even raised his own hypothesis about how to explain these facts throughout the entire night. Therefore, since Nathaniel cannot do either one of those, the resurrection hypothesis stands. Thank you. exact same thing that I thought he was going to present, because for the last 2,000 years, although a little bit of a bit of hedging has been done, they haven't brought up anything new, because there's nothing new to bring up, because there's the Bible, and by the way, I bring up the book of Acts, it doesn't mean I believe that nonsense, I mean, it's the contradictions in there, by the way, Daniel B. Wallace, the, the famous Greek scholar, completely disagrees with you regarding the supposed contradictory language of the book of Acts, so if you're going to bring up just like uh, arguments from authority, there's one for you. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't believe that nonsense. Handling snakes and all that? No. It, it, that's, what, that's in your book, not mine. Uh, we, we talk about it, it, what is the most what, what is the most plausible scenario? It's that Jesus was crucified and tossed into a mass grave. That's it. That is the most plausible. We talk about probability. Right? I, I do science. This is what we talk about. We talk about probabilities. How many people in the history of our world have risen from the dead? Zero. I appreciate the answer. Zero. So we talk about probability. 
Let's consider it. Jesus was crucified and died on a cross, which again, you're I don't address your two points because that was what I was conceding for the sake of this debate. And yes, I would love to debate the gospel sometime. Uh, that's, I'm actually, I actually know the gospels better than the resurrection of Jesus. That would be great. We should do that. Set it up. At Texas State University in San Marcos. Set it up. Um, that, that didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> the, the, what would the Romans do? They would, do they, would, they would crucify people every single day. And they would do it in Jerusalem every single day. And it wasn't just done on some hill named Golgotha. It was everywhere. They did it all the time. Pontius Pilate, even though, even, even the, the weekly that he was considering, everybody that was around him, especially those in Syria, would still do it all the time. And you know what they would do? They would toss people in mass graves. That's the most plausible scenario. Now, if I'm following somebody around for supposedly three or four years, and I'm saying that they're supposedly doing miracles, even though I forgot the, two, the, the loaves and the fish more than once because I was surprised he was able to do it again, okay, uh, if I'm doing that for the past three years, I don't want people to think that what I, what I have seen with the person that I'm following, even though if I can look in the Essenes and look at what the Maccabees are saying about what we expected this God to be was to be somebody that brought us out of the, the, the persecution of the Romans, maybe I don't, and the only people that are mentioned, by the way, yeah, we went over this last time. The only people that are mentioned are, are, are what, uh, uh, Kephas, right? And, and James, the supposed brother of Jesus, who, by the way, if you are the brother of a god, you believe he is a god. That is the way that goes. And in fact, they might not have actually been James, the brother of Jesus, that we're talking about. We can get into a million things there. But the most plausible explanation when somebody is crucified is that they die. Are there stories that are made up of, of, of a plethora of dying and rising gods? Yes. Does it mean that any of them are true? And why don't you accept any of those? Because there is just as much evidence that Osiris, that Salmoxus, that Romulus, that, that oh my gosh, I could go in and on. So how many different gods supposedly died and rose from the grave, even three days later? And you accept none of those, even though they have the exact same amount of evidence of Jesus rising from the dead. And yes, Paul very specifically said that he got it from Revelation. Does Revelation mean something different to you than it does to me? I don't, I don't think so. But I think the only thing you could possibly take from this entire debate at any point that you ever read these things critically, which again, I do recommend, is that sure, Jesus could have lived. Jesus could have been what's seen as a political adversary to the Romans and even to the Jews and the Sanhedrin, but certainly not the Pharisees, and that he would, that this could have happened. And that then a person would have been crucified. Yes. But to say somebody rose from the dead, I don't know how you could actually jump to that conclusion regardless of what Dina said. Thank you. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, let's give another round of applause to our students. Very impressed. Thank you guys very much. Uh, we have scheduled just a brief amount of time for questions, uh, because I imagine everyone has been here uh, there's lack of a break and all that, but if you all might stick around for a little bit afterwards too, I'm sure there could be some more um, conversation. I don't, if I can speak for, Nathaniel, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll stay as long as y'all want to stay, if that's okay with you. You do that for... Well, I can sleep on the way. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, what we'll do for our audience members then is we'll take time for just a couple questions, and I apologize for keeping that portion brief, but um, uh, just for the sake of time for everyone. So, are there any audience questions or comments or points of discussion that you'd like to address with our speakers? Yes, sir. Uh, we'll, we'll do those two. You guys have the first two hands up. So. I'd just like to ask Nathaniel, what, what happened 2019 years ago? 2019 years ago? Yes. I don't know. Neither do you. Why did the days change? Oh, you mean from you mean into um, CE? Yes. Sure. This this comes from the Greek Roman calendars, and, and that that seems to be the case because but there are many other calendars other than the ones we use today, and you're aware of that, right? It just so happens to be the people who made the calendars we use today were the people in power that they said Jesus was the one, and that was why they did that. But and even you were but, there but you're even talk say again. And you were there and saw that. No, but there's historical evidence that actually happened. Um, and, and we actually even know when it happened. And if you'd like, I can provide you the extra biblical sources of that. Um, but this, but, but there's even, you could even say, why did it change at a certain date if he was born in 4 BCE or 
seven CE, depending on which gospel you read. Why, why did it change at zero? Do you know the answer to that? I'm asking you. Uh, well, I don't know. But I know they gave a certain date. But then you look at it, and you look at when was the, you read the book of Matthew. Was he born during the time of Herod in 4 BCE? Was he during, born during the time of Quirinius, like it says in the book of Luke? But they said, they said they put a, a certain date on it because they were the Catholic Church, Roman Catholics, were the people that were in charge at that point, and that was the religion that was the most dominant at the time, and still is today. That's why. But now you look at if we look at historians, we don't use you know BC and AD anymore, BCE and CE, but the, the common era. And that's the reason why. So. Um, just just real real quick um, to the gentleman's question, um, Nathaniel Nathaniel is right with regards to the calendar change. Um, however, that has, we need to keep in mind that that has no bearing on whether or not the resurrection and the evidence that's been provided tonight is true. Um, so I think it's a, it's a neat question, and I think it's a, a good question, but I don't know that it has any, any substantive um, impact on what we've talked about tonight. That's a good question. Well, I get why you're asking it, though. You do the word you're there, and I understand that. But we actually have evidence as to why it's happened. So I, I appreciate it. And I believe you had a hand up as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is for Nathaniel. Yes. The story you gave about the dinosaur. Yes. Was it a dream or a hallucination or if it was real, did you record it? I'm, I'm uncertain. Uh, it's the same thing that happens to me, and she, she can attest to this all the time, where I have PTSD, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and I don't know where I am, and I see things that I'm certain are there, um, and, and I am terrified by what, what, I, what I believe, and I run across a room not knowing where I'm at sometimes. Does that mean that they were actually there, though? Um, I don't know. I mean, I would say that I wouldn't believe me. Um, Quick follow-up, when you said it's certain you're here, hmm? if it's a big dinosaur, it come through your window, it would break down, or it would Yeah, it was, it was outside, so. Oh, it was outside. Yeah. Oh, okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll let you have one final question, and then we'll maybe break. And I appreciate you all saying you yeah, around for additional sure. questions. Yes, sir. A question is also for Nathaniel. Um, you claim that um, when he asked this question, that we don't know what happened 2,000 years ago. Like he doesn't know, you don't know. Correct. What's the whole point of this debate and bringing up your arguments and claims that in the end we don't know? Sure, because people believe this. People stake their lives on it. People attempt to legislate based on this sometimes. Um, and I want to believe as many true things as possible, and I believe that you do as well. And the purpose of this debate is to, if we're going to believe something, that we have good reasons to do it, right? Um, and that really, I think, is what it is. And then, obviously, for, for you coming here and people that are, that are religious coming here, am I, do I have a firm foundation for the reasons that I believe? And if, if you don't believe, am I, do I have a firm foundation for why I don't? And should I look into these things? These are, people take nothing more serious than faith. I think I can say that to be, yeah? Um, I agree. Would give, you know, the, 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 how many times have we seen in, in, not just in the Bible, but extra biblically as well, because certain people certainly trust in martyr, the reason that the word martyr exists, right? Because somebody certainly did die. Um, but if we're taking this so seriously, it is the most important things in our lives. Shouldn't we know to the best that we can know something that what we believe is true. No, I, I agree with Nathaniel. As I said in my uh, opening, um, I don't think that there's there's a more important question um, that any of us in this room tonight can answer outside of did Jesus rise from the grave. Um, and so that's why you know some of the things that we've talked about tonight are so important because while Nathaniel and I stand on opposite sides. Um, the reason that we're here is because we take these things seriously, and we think, uh, and well, I'm not going to speak for Nathaniel, but I think, you know, just the way in which culture is, we don't think about these types of things enough uh, in culture. And, and then just as a, as a side note, um, not that I see things like, like Nathaniel, but, you know, there are uh, instances, I have PTSD, or, or I have suffered from PTSD as well. Um, and my wife can attest their nights where I wake up 
and a sweat and I think that I've been in a, in a firefight. Um, but the interesting thing about that as it pertains to this conversation and this debate is that I might have dreamed that I was in a firefight, but my wife cannot share that dream with me. There's no way that I could, uh, or even if I had a good dream, like, hey, I'm surfing in Hawaii. I don't roll over and say, hey, babe, um, why don't you come join me in Hawaii? We need a vacation. Which, the reason I point that out is because um, with regards to the discussion tonight, and, and I'll give Nathaniel a chance to respond, it's, it's almost there, mm -hmm. um, is that hallucinations uh, are like dreams in the sense that they can't be shared. They're mind independent with no external referent. So when you have Jesus appearing, uh, or in the early creeds, appearing to Cephas, appearing to the 12, appearing to 500, um, 500 people statistically do not share the same dream, do not share the same hallucination. So the question becomes, what's the best explanation um, for those group appearances if hallucinations can be shared just like dreams? So I'll have let Nathaniel uh, counter that if he wants to. Group hallucinations are rare. It happens. Carl Holtz is a great example. But perhaps this is a good place for us to yeah. end uh, for here. But I appreciate you both uh, being uh, available for more discussion afterwards. Please just give a one more round of applause. <laughs>